So in this kind of context, what I'm talking about as being scientifically necessary is politically unfeasible. Can you imagine being elected on a platform of reducing the economy by 80%? <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not politically feasible. But what's politically feasible, the, 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 well, you know, carbon sequestration, um, carbon trading and all of that stuff has no effect whatsoever on, on the reality in which we're operating, at least not at present. It's scientifically irrelevant. Now again, I'm not saying anything that's really not new. There's a wonderful book I, I think you all should read. So when you go on half time, which I'm sure most of you will do as you leave the, here, you'll have much more time to read and educate yourself. But if you have a chance, Read Tuchman's March of Folly. Uh, Barbara Tuchman's a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, U.S. historian. Her March of Folly is a book about exactly what we're talking about. The historical evidence that throughout history governments operate against the interests of their constituents. Wooden headedness plays a remarkably large role in government. It consists, see if you recognize any of this now, it consists of assessing a situation in terms of preconceived fixed notions. Ideology, anyone? While ignoring any contrary signs. It is acting according to wish, while not allowing oneself to be deflected by the facts. That's what we've been talking about here. Uh, so she had it all together. Again, evidence that this is not news. Gustave Le Bon wrote about it in the late 19th century in his famous book on the crowd, a study of the popular mind. And he's talking about you folks. The masses have never thirsted after truth. They turn aside from evidence that is not to their taste, preferring to deify error if error seduces them. And by the way, you know we're all seduced by the lifestyles to which we have been programmed to Except, right? Whoever can supply them with the illusions is easily their master. And anyone who attempts to destroy our illusions is the victim. We shoot the bearer of bad news. Okay? Max Planck, almost a hundred years later, famous physicist, made a very similar statement, and it has to do with the human neuro neurology. The last slide gets to that. A new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light but rather because its opponents eventually die. <laughs> and a new generation uh, grows up that is familiar with it. So the progress of ideas, once you become stuck in a particular way of thinking, very difficult to move on. That's what both of these statements really are saying. Finally, in the last oh, couple of decades, n n neuroscientists and cognitive scientists have begun to discover the mechanism by which this is possible. Now it turns out that in the course of the development of the individual, young people growing up in a particular family situation, church situation, cultural situation, political ideology, you know if your families have always been liberals or whatever, you keep hearing the same kind of stuff repeated over and over and over again. You go to the same kinds of meetings and so on and so forth. And the point is that as the brain is developing, the repetition of pattern creates the, the synaptic circuit that comes into play whenever you think about those kinds of issues again. It's just like use, uh, learning a musical instrument in a way. You know, I, know, I play oboe. I don't have to look at the notes to play. It's just all automatic because I've done it 157,000 times. Well, our brains develop automatic circuitry right, as we grow. Now, the point is then, subsequently, once you've got your ideology, once you've got your ideas, the foundational premises upon which you're going to act out your life in place, you can change them, but it's difficult. But the point is that once they're in place, people seek out compatible experiment, experiences. rather. And when faced with information that does not agree with these preformed synaptic circuits, we will deny, discredit, reinterpret, or forget that information. This is the nature of denial. Now, how many of you think of yourselves as interested in environmental and global political issues? How many of you are captains of industry? <laughs> All right, so I'm just proving my point. <laughs> that you are predisposed to having your views reinforced. So you come to meetings like this every Thursday night <laughs> on, on, during the month. 
But we seek out those experiences that reinforce what we want to hear and we deny, discredit, and generally reject contrary information. You see why we're so messed up as a species? Because the people who believe in A, B, and C will believe in A, B, and C until they die. And those of us in the minority who believe in X, Y, and Z aren't getting anywhere, and that's a big problem. So, this is my last slide. We have an unprecedented opportunity. Since we are mythic creatures, the opportunity that we have is to rewrite our cultural narrative in a way that takes us towards survival. We have to override the maladaptive tendencies. We have to move away from selfishness, com competition, and the kinds of behaviors that are dooming us to the kind of competitive struggle to the, you know, the last man, so to speak, on the planet, and to create a new cultural mythology that emphasizes our common interests, community values, and our shared, uh, well, interest in retaining the only planetary home that we have. Historically, it paid off to exploit your short-term selfish interests. Today, we, for the first time in the history of our species, reached the point where my selfish interests are identical to our collective interests. I cannot be sustainable on my own. No country can be sustainable on its own. If the rest of the world carries on down the current pathway, they will take us down with it. So, instead of being able to act out my own personal selfish fantasy, I've got to begin to identify my interests with your interests. Because together we can pull this off if we convince enough people that it is in their selfish interest to serve the collective interest. It's the only way that we're going to make any real difference on this planet. So a movement like the World Federalists, although I have you know, problems with this or that dimension of it, is precisely the kind of direction we need to go at the level of creating a common cultural mythology across the planet that reinforces the inherent need that we have for a planet that works for our mutual benefit. It can't work if each of us decides always to appropriate the most we can in our short lifespan on Earth. Thanks so much for that. And we'll